So a very warm welcome from my side of the Pacific and my side of the world to everybody else who lives in the Southern Hemisphere, either here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or just across the ditch in Australia. And also a very warm welcome. Seems like you really need the warmth as well, not just us here in winter, but also you up in spring, up in Europe primarily. So thank you everybody for joining this webinar on, on Mahara. Um, today I'm planning to give you a little introduction to it and um, mainly also to the idea of portfolios, showing a few examples and then pointing out a number of the highlights why we are working with Mahara. And um, if you are looking for the new features, they, that is a completely separate webinar, which will be offered over the next three days starting tomorrow where you can learn about all the fantastic new features that we've been able to implement just at the end of April. And um, if you haven't signed up for them yet, but would like to do so, then you can follow this link that I just posted in the chat and it will also be towards the end of the slides. Many of you um, already know that um, my name is Christina Hoppner and I work for Catalyst IT in Wellington. And um, Catalyst is a software development company primarily for web applications. And we have offices in the country here in Auckland and Christchurch, as well as in Australia, in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. We are also represented, represented in Europe um, in our Brighton office in the UK and also in Dublin for our European Union office. And since last year, we have also have um, an office in Canada, or at least a remote office at the moment, which was officially launched um, just earlier this month. And they are also offering all the e-learning services that we are offering in New Zealand, Australia and in Europe. And um, yeah, for the longest time, we have been very active in all sorts of open source communities. But most of you know us from the Mahara and also Moodle or Totara space. But Catalyst itself does a whole lot of uh, lots of other applications to own lots of different systems, uh, working with governments and uh, big and small businesses and also uh, different institutions of uh, learning, primarily tertiary, in all our countries. And since 2006, we have been involved in the Mahara project. As you can see from the date, we will be celebrating the 15th anniversary of this open source project um, that is of interest to us here today, uh, later in the year, because the first commit, so the first code that went into the software officially was um, towards the end of September in 2006. And so Catalyst had been the development partner from the start for the tertiary institutions that decided to build that platform. And since then, we've been maintaining it um, with our team in Wellington, as well as also our colleagues um, across the world and our community members who also contribute um, fantastic new features uh, to the software, small features, new features, bug fixes, and also sometimes extremely large features. And a few of those you can see in Mahara 2104 that um, has just been released at the end of last month. Um, and today I want to give you a brief overview and um, look into why we are creating Mahara and why we are maintaining Mahara and making that ePortfolio platform available to all of you. So let's take a look at a student. Um, this is Aroha and um, she studies at a tertiary institution and um, actually in her institution a lot of different portfolios are being created and she's asked to um, create a number of different portfolios. 
And by no means is this an exhaustive list of portfolios that can be created. Um, they are more representative of the sort of portfolios that um, I see on a regular basis these days and um, that have distinguishing characteristics. And please, um, if you like, um, put into the chat what sort of portfolios you are creating or you are supporting um, in, in your workplace and so that we get to know a little bit more of what you're doing. So one of the first uh, portfolios that Aroha encounters is the learning portfolio. That is geared towards her progress in her learning towards her development and um, really looks at progress rather than an end result so that she can look back after a semester or after two semesters and can really see what the big milestones were in her learning in a particular subject um, or for a particular paper or course or um, overall in her university career also looking at uh, graduate attributes for example and in that learning, portfo uh, learning portfolios can be used quite extensively for example in language learning because there we really document the progress through that uh, learning and can also see where we were at the start and then where we were in the middle and in, at the end. Now, next to the learning portfolio, um, oftentimes we find the assessment portfolio um, at the university or polytechnic level because it is a university, students do want to get grades and so oftentimes the extrinsic motivator of having to do an assessment and having to submit an assignment is just really large and therefore a lot of portfolios are created in that area to cover off um, assignments that also require reflections that are a very important element in the portfolio process and also assignments that um, might be project work and that can be collaborative or just um, for one student. And these assignments um, are then oftentimes used um, alongside traditional assessments um, or ex exams and over the last year we have had anecdotal evidence that some universities have gone over to using portfolios more um, or increasingly instead of just going down the online exams road because portfolios um, are more suited oftentimes to working asynchronously and um, not needing to be on the computer at a very specific time um, as you would be or would have to be for an online exam. And so they are a wonderful alternative and very viable alternative to still do assessment with the students, um, yet not requiring an online exam. Now in New Zealand, we also see quite a few portfolios that are created for work integrated learning activities. So that those are your internships, externships, um, work placements, practicums, or whatever they are being called at your institution or in your country. And um, these work integrated learning portfolios are fantastic for the university to follow along the progress of a student while they are on practicum, um, to give them feedback or to see where they are at, and maybe even for employers to have a look at them and see how the students feel about their work in, in their chosen um, internship and uh, whether they need in, any assistance. And also, of course, for the students, they are fantastic uh, because they document their progress throughout that very intense learning experience and can then later on look back at that once they are back at uni and uh, want to consolidate all that they have learned and see what they want to do with that body of knowledge, with the competencies and skills they have earned in order to go forward. There is also the showcase portfolio. In some cases, you might know it as presentation portfolio um, in which students showcase 
their skills, competencies, what they have learned. So that's quite different from the learning portfolio where, where we are looking at the progress and the learning over time. Um, in the showcase portfolio, oftentimes it is the end product that is in view um, and that is being showcased. So sometimes there might not be a huge reflective element included that can then, for example, be found in the learning portfolio or also in the assessment portfolio. But it doesn't mean that showcase portfolios cannot have reflections. Um, they certainly can. And um, those reflections can then also highlight really, really well um, why a particular piece of evidence has been included in that showcase. And the last portfolio that I want to press, um, introduce today is the professional certification portfolio, um, which we see increasingly when students leave their institutions, when they finish their studies and start in a profession such as teacher, nurse, plumber, hairdresser, or pharmacist or doctor. Um, because oftentimes in those professions, they need to meet certain standards, certain competencies, and also need to have an annual or triannual re-registration in order to showcase the um, authorizing body that yes, I can still do my job. I, can, I still have the skills. I'm keeping up to date with my skills. I'm learning throughout my career. And these professional certification portfolios, um, at least the ones that we have seen lately, differ from some, some of the other university portfolios in the sense that they are oftentimes more prescribed because they need to follow a particular framework, a particular set of competencies that need to be met and therefore are oftentimes templatized. So we'll take a look at a at what such a portfolio could look like and how to set it up um, just in a little bit. And so I've gone through those portfolio types. And as I said, please feel free to put in your own types that you're using or if you're using any of these types into the chat. Um, so we've looked at these five different types of portfolios um, kind of in isolation. However, they don't often appear in isolation. Oftentimes there is some sort of overlap. So a learning portfolio can also become an assessment portfolio with a slight modification or a work integrated learning portfolio might actually be an assessment portfolio. A professional certification portfolio is also an assessment portfolio, but assessment done oftentimes differently. And a showcase portfolio can also include evidence from any of the other portfolios. So while we think of these different types of portfolios, um, oftentimes in reality, they don't necessarily have such fine delineating borders, but um, kind of influence each other and flow into each other. And especially when you create your portfolio online, you have the advantage of repurposing evidence from one portfolio in another. So evidence that you've uploaded initially for a learning portfolio might very well end up in a showcase portfolio, but maybe just framed differently with a different introduction um, or with another piece of evidence on the side that really highlights why um, that portfolio is being showcased. And um, any of the other types of portfolios that you might be aware of or might be using can also flow in here and oftentimes have these fuzzy edges to um, other types of portfolios. Now I think it is time to take a look at what some of these example portfolios are, um, where I can show you um, what portfolios could look like and when, why or how we can see also um, what a portfolio is in contrast to just a project report um, or a project description. 
And the first portfolio I want to share here is the one from Teresa McKinnon, um, who used to be a lecturer at Warwick University and is now in her well-deserved retirement. Um, purposely, you're not supposed to read the text. Um, if you follow the slides, you can click on the image and actually um, go to the portfolio itself and there you can then read it. What I want to showcase um, here with this example is the type of language that can be used in a portfolio that tells us immediately that um, working uh, ways of working with a portfolio and um, for your thinking um, strategies have been used. So for example, um, in one of her um, writings for the for becoming or for remaining a certified member of the Association of Learning Technologists, um, a professional certification, um, she says a highlight. Um, a highlight of my professional career and so on. And that means in a portfolio, we don't show everything that we have done. We carefully select what we want to display uh, or what we want to talk about. And so that is um, very important because that way we can guide our readers and viewers of the portfolio to what we want them to see. So what is important to us, what we find is important to convey. Whereas if we just gave them our entire computer and they needed to sift through all the files uh, that are on there, it would be um, not really a good experience because they wouldn't know what they are looking for. They would always question what is important, what is not important. And they might find things important that are completely unimportant to us. And so with a portfolio, what we do is we really focus the attention on the important things. And so a highlight is what Teresa is describing rather than telling us about her career from A through Z. Then she also says the point at which I realized that my online experiences of connecting um, were relevant to others is again, she finds that one moment, she goes back in time, she thinks back at what she had done and how this one particular point in time or event triggered her to, to know, okay, something has changed. And that is what she is highlighting in her portfolio because that way we can zero in quickly on that and we know what she is talking about. And similarly, I revisited. I've revisited each of the sections of my original CMALT submission in order to complete the review. So she does that review process. She does the reflection. She goes back to what she had done and critically examines it and says, okay, have I progressed since then? Have I done differently? What have I done differently? But she is not doing that in isolation, um, all by herself. Feedback and mentoring was very helpful to her in her career to enhance her learning, to see the, the things that she has done very well, the things where she might need um, more assistance from others or where she can learn from others. And just these four short uh, phrases give us very good insight into what a portfolio is about. It is a curation of all of our learning um, evidence in order to convey meaning and really also tell our story that we want to tell to this particular audience. So kind of going back to the, to the five different types of portfolios that I introduced, um, our audience for a learning portfolio might be a very different one than the one we have for the assessment portfolio or for a work integrated learning portfolio or a showcase or a professional certification. And so all of these portfolios, while created by one person, might look different and might put the focus on different elements because that is really writing for that audience and knowing what is important in that particular context. 
Now, just a couple of um, other examples that I wanted to show you. Um, this one here is from a student at Dublin City University in uh, Dublin, and she has won the recent ePortfolio Showcase at DCU um, for her portfolio. And so this portfolio is for local studies in, um, in an education degree. And uh, Chelsea here takes us through um, the history of her area and creates a project portfolio in which she incorporates text, images, also embeds videos, and provides a lively account of her area. And not just in one page, but really in multiple pages. And so here she introduces us to where she lives and the many different facets that um, are available in her area. And so there are many more pages um, where she digs very deep and um, goes through her project. This is a very nice example of um, showcasing of how Mahara can be adopted and also personalized um, because she is working with the skin where she's been using a header image and um, she also works with a, a number of different multimedia artifacts in order to make her portfolio easily accessible to every viewer without them needing to download files or open them in different tabs and so on. A second example from DCU um, is this one here from uh, a student in uh, music education. Um, Laura, Laura's portfolio is a very nice example of a reflective account um, of what she has learned throughout her life up to this point and how she ties it back to music education and how important music has been throughout her uh, not just university career, but also already pre-university life. And so she really tells her personal story of what music means to her, why she is studying um, music education, and um, also gives us insight into um, her own work as well as introduces us to projects that are dear to her heart and that are important for her. So she summarizes projects she's been involved in and then also always gives an, uh, a reflective account on them. So very nice portfolio. And this one, all on one page, and again, using skins um, so that she can have um, her music background um, available as well, tying also the design to her degree. A third example that I wanted to show you is uh, this one here that is a just a very brief made up one for you uh, because we can't often show portfolios from other people, especially when they are certification uh, portfolios because they are not made public. So what I've done here instead is um, created a short portfolio do to just show you how a template can be set up um, in order to work with that and make it available to students or also faculty. So here this portfolio um, works with the portfolio completion page um, and it can also include uh, smart evidence here, the career readiness one, for example, but it doesn't have to. In Mahara 2104, we've um, added a number of new features to this portfolio completion page, which are very fantastic and work really well. Um, if you do want to work with a competency portfolio and have um, all every competency on a single page, um, rather than work with smart evidence where you can create topical pages and then tie them back to a competency. And so here in this portfolio, um, there's the portfolio completion page. Um, there's also the smart evidence page and then a couple of extra template pages. 
And uh, for me, a template is actually not something set in stone. Um, it is rather an invitation for people to get started with something. And all the functionalities in Mahara that um, so go with the template are geared towards supporting students as, or learners in general, as well as institutions. So what you have on what you can put onto a template page is, for example, instructions. And these instructions can go for the entire page. And that means that you don't need to send um, your learners off to another website or to a PDF download for them to get the pertinent information of what is important here, but they can get that directly from this page. If you work with text blocks, you can also, in addition to page instructions, have text block specific instructions that then also make it easier for people to just fill in these particular parts. And the nice thing about any of those instructions is that when the portfolio has been set up as a template, students who copy that template or who receive it automatically into their account cannot change the instructions. So that is a nod towards the um, institutions that do need to create assessment portfolios and need to ensure that certain elements are not changed. And so certain elements in this case is the instructions. But what you can also do is actually leave it up to the students what sort of evidence they want to put onto a page. And that is where our placeholder blocks come in. Some of you might remember them as magic blocks when we introduced them um, in uh, uh, just a few versions ago. And they allow students to receive a template and have a structure given in the template. So for example, here with evidence one, two, three, and four. However, what sort of evidence is being supposed to uh, is being displayed is not determined so the students can decide okay for evidence one i want to have a text block or i want to use an image or i want to add a pdf or a video so it is entirely up to them to decide what they want to showcase there or what they want to include in that particular part of the um, of the template and therefore, really having that balance between guiding learners, scaffolding their portfolio creation, yet still leaving them enough space to be creative and to use um, artifacts and evidence that speak to them and that um, they want to include. So not everybody has to write a text students could record their voice on a mobile device and then upload it into their portfolio instead of having um, written text there. And so they wouldn't need to remove the block and add a um, embedded media block, but they can immediately start with the embedded media block, which in my opinion is a better way of approaching that because we are not telling the student you have to remove something first, something that we thought might have might have been the, the best thing to use, and, and you can put your own thing there, but really have the invitation and leave it up to the student to decide what sort of evidence they want to put in. And of course, they could also delete all of those elements or move them around the page. Um, kind of going back to that portfolio completion page, uh, there is some new functionality that I do want to um, show you very brief briefly. And that surrounds this entire big space below that portfolio completion. So if you've already worked with the portfolio completion functionality, you know that as learner, um, I can sign off on a page and say, okay, my page is ready. Um, but that was pretty much it what I could do. And then of course, an, um, a manager could come and also say and verify the page. However, 
um, we now also have the possibility of um, adding a reviewer to the portfolio. Um, and that doesn't even have to, they don't even have to have the role of the reviewer because the template creator can decide who shall be able to um, perform a review on a portfolio. And so I just need to find Praveen. Log in as them. And then when they can see their portfolio or the portfolio of uh, Polly, they can very quickly also do a review and a review for the entire portfolio. So that is something completely new, this review statement, which is entirely customizable. Um, because in the past, what you could do, you could leave feedback on individual pages of the portfolio or on individual pieces of artifacts, correct? Um, but now what you can do is really have a review statement, either a pre-written one, if for example, an organization requires um, particular text in the statement that just needs to be confirmed or approved, have that there. Um, or alternatively, you can also have an overarching comment sitting there um, that is then made visible. And so what I can now do is take my statement and as soon as I do that, in this case, the review statement block has been configured so that the portfolio is locked um, from editing. So the student can't make any changes. Another reviewer cannot be added. And if I want to revert my review statement, I would need to get in touch with the site administrator. So if I do that now, I can't change that. And it also says that I made the statement and the time I made it. Um, a statement can also be made anonymously. Um, so we do have a ton of options there for that review statement block, which I think is quite a game changer, especially for portfolios that do need a statement like that, an overall statement um, around the portfolio so that um, it can then also be fully assessed and students cannot change it. And that the locking has been done even though the student hasn't submitted the portfolio. So in this case, we've only shared the portfolio. So lots of new possibilities um, for working in particular with portfolios for assessment purposes and also professional certification that we've included in 2104 that I'm happy to show you more of in the intros uh, or in the new feature session. Okay. So kind of a couple of things that I've already mentioned while going through the, um, through the examples here is um, the idea of folio thinking. That when we create a portfolio, we are essentially telling stories. Um, and folio thinking is, uh, is an idea that um, Helen Chen and others um, came up uh, several years ago to talk about portfolio creation. And I in particular like this um, very concise definition by Vicky Suta that is on her blog um, that reads that folio thinking is a process of engaging in the collection, organization, reflection, and connection that leads to a person's ability to speak intelligently and concisely, i.e. tell stories, about one's learning experiences, what they mean and their value, and how the experiences relate one to each other. And as you can see from these highlighted words, we have collection, organization, reflection, connection, tell stories, and relationships. And all of these things we can actually do in Mahara. Oops. 
And for me, they are five main, kind of all of these things result in uh, five main activities surrounding the portfolio evidence. And while the definition does not start with the creation of evidence, I find creating evidence is also some part of, or is one activity that you can do in Mahara because um, you can create blog posts, you can write text directly onto pages. Um, and then of course, also do the collection which is uploading files, embedding videos, um, embedding audio files, uploading audio, um, any other type of multimedia that you can embed into pages. Um, or with files, really just collect them in your files area and then sort through them. And that is the third activity, very important for the portfolio process, the curation and uh, curating your portfolio evidence. Because as we've seen with um, Teresa's example, but also Laura's example, um, is that we are not telling our entire story and talk about every single little thing that has happened. Um, we are purposely choosing crucial moments in our learner story or in our personal story that we want to highlight because they are the most pertinent evidence to sh um, for telling our story to that particular audience. And so like a museum curator, if you curate your portfolio, you organize it, um, you label it, you might take um, evidence, you might sort it into folders if it is files, and you also put it into different portfolios um, because it is those portfolios then that form the basis for the next activity, which is um, having conversations with other people around them, inviting other people in mm -hmm. to take part of the learner story, to learn about us, um, to give us feedback or comment on what we have done, um, give us encouragement or constructive feedback. And that I find is also one of the wonderful things of using an electronic platform because we are not creating just a file or presentation in isolation, but having people react to that um, and have those comments become part of the portfolio because they live in the portfolio itself. And therefore, when we look back at a portfolio, we can see those comments and we can remember them and use them to go forward in our learning journey. And lastly, there is also the activity of connecting um, because Mahara is not just there for to create personal portfolios, but you can also create group portfolios or you can connect with others in groups for discussions and um, to share files or share opinions, uh, set up communities of practice, communities um, of learning and really work together, collaborate, um, on what is important to you and therefore create shared content, shared knowledge and also shared experiences and make those visible to others. And that is pretty much a lot about Mahara. Um, what we've looked at today is just a few examples of portfolio types and where we can find them in particular in higher education or tertiary education, further education and um, workplaces. We've also looked at um, just a very few number of examples and the link on the samples page takes you to a few more uh, that you can explore on your own. and. If you know of public portfolios, maybe from your own institutions, please do let me know um, so that we can add them to our gallery of portfolios. And we've then kind of coming from those learner stories, um, 
we've kind of distilled it down to what it means to create a portfolio and the activities that flow into it and um, that we can see there um, through the definition of folio thinking and then going into the main activities that we can do on Mahara, expanding from our three main ones that we have on the website, create, share, engage, just really um, taking a closer look in particular at the create element um, because there is just so much included in it with the collection, curation and conversation and then also the connection with others. Now, if you want to learn more about portfolios in general, then I invite you to check out these free resources. And if you're following the slides, um, I'll just pop the link in again in the chat. Um, you can click directly on the links and on the pictures to go to them. And so all of these resources are free, freely available online. Um, some you can download, some you can access um, only online. And um, there we have uh, Sam Taylor's guide for designing effective e-portfolio activities. Um, very nice, um, short, practical, um, proven activities to get started. And Sam is a colleague of mine in our Catalyst um, Brighton office. The second publication that you see here is um, the ePortfolio Based Assessment, a resource from Dublin City University, um, edited by Lisa Donaldson, uh, where she is um, where, where she gathered case studies on using ePortfolios for assessment from many different institutions, in particular in Ireland and the UK, um, showcasing what can be done with portfolios. Um, thirdly, you'll see the first iteration of the digital ethics principles in ePortfolios, which is uh, the result of a task force um, that Abel started in 2019. Here are the first 10 principles. Currently, we are working on, the, uh, on another three that we will make public at the Abel annual meeting at the end of July. Um, where we are also looking in particular at um, diversity, inclusion, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and decolonization as one principle, um, visibility of labor, both visibility of um, faculty labor as also student labor and evaluation um, because assessment and evaluation are very big um, portfolio um, elements or have a very big impact on portfolio creation and therefore we wanted to look at um, evaluation also from a digital ethics perspective. And at the bottom, um, those two publications, many of you might already know, um, are the Field Guide to ePortfolio, also um, a publication by Abel, um, co-authored by, I believe, roughly 53 different authors. And um, another publication by Dublin City University, The Learning Portfolio in Higher Education, A Game of Snakes and Letters. Very neat um, resource um, that gives a good um, literature review and also ideas and insights into why learning portfolios are so important. So that rounds up our webinar for today. Um, if you are interested in seeing more of the Mahara 2104 features that we have not looked at today, um, please feel free to sign up for one of the webinars uh, that are coming up over the next three days. Um, again, this time um, on Thursday, no, uh, tomorrow, this time tomorrow, um, so that might work for everybody who's been in here today and then a couple of different times also more for the um, southern hemisphere and um, you're welcome to join those free uh, one of those free webinars if you haven't already signed up and if you'd like to get in touch with me you can certainly do so very easily via email or also on social media 
um, Twitter or LinkedIn or the like or where you are already connected with me and I always look forward and um, very much enjoy listening to what different people do with Mahara or with portfolios also in general um, no matter the the platform that is used um, because all the resources that the, those free resources that I shared with you are pretty much portfolio agnostic because we do also want to uh, promote the idea of working with portfolios in general and then look well how can the platform support that portfolio creation process and now we still have a few minutes time for any of your comments or questions or if you have to go to a next meeting or finish your dinner or start your dinner thank you so much for having been here today and i look forward to connecting with you some other time